Isn't it beautiful when things just come together? Time's gone inside out. Build a beautiful website with Squarespace. Time gets to start again. Blog Talk Radio. We are the UR Tennis Network. Our mission is to be the voice of tennis. We enlist a team of passionate enthusiasts to promote our sport. We strive to bring interesting perspectives on the many spins of tennis. Our goal is to provide the learners of our sport with current news and information from many angles. We seek active participation from communities interested in tennis, but tennis is not interested in them. We are expanding our outreach. Tennis is a true lifetime sport that needs to be talked about. And the UR Tennis Network pledges to pursue this idea relentlessly. Good morning and welcome to the Parenting Aces radio show on Blog Talk Radio's UR Tennis Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and today I am going to be joined by Gail Pitts-Black and her daughter, Nicole Pitts, both of whom are going to be talking with, with us about raising high-level tennis players. Um, Nicole's going to talk with us about her growing up in tennis and her experience and her journey and what she's doing now. And Gail will share her experiences raising all three of her daughters in the professional world of tennis. And, uh, man, does she have some incredible stories to share. And uh, I know she's so proud of all three of her girls, so I'm really looking forward to picking her brain a little bit. And honestly, the purpose of having Gail and Nicole on the show today is to really illustrate what it takes for a junior player to reach the highest levels of the game and have success professionally, but also at the top level of the junior game. I think a lot of us get into this junior tennis thing, um, you know, because either our kid has a dream of being the next Serena Williams or Roger Federer, or we have that dream for our child, but we don't truly understand what that means and the work that it takes to get there. So it's going to be really enlightening for us to hear from these two ladies and uh, listen to their stories. Before I bring them on the air, I just want to remind you that if you'd like to call in and join us today, that number is 714-583-6853. Again, 714-583-6853. Also, just a reminder that the show runs live for an hour, but if we go a little past that time, you can catch the end of the show on the podcast. That'll be online later this afternoon at parentingaces.com. Okay, I'm going to go to a quick commercial, and when we come back, Gail Pitts Black and Nicole Pitts joining us live on the air. Warning. Orthopedic surgeons are seeing an increase in overuse injuries when young athletes perform the same repetitive, repetitive, repetitive stressful motions over and over. over. Pitching, tennis, weight training, even long swimming workouts can cause overuse trauma that may require surgery. If your kids play and train hard, visit orthoinfo.org or stopsportsinjuries.org. A message from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. Welcome back to the Parenting Aces radio show on Blog Talk Radio's UR Tennis Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and we are joined by Nicole Pitts and Gail Pitts-Black today. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me. Thank, thank you. you, Lisa. We have just so much to talk about today. I'm I'm really excited to pick both your brains about how you got started in tennis and and this journey that your family has been on. I I'd love to start with Nicole and maybe Nicole you can give us a kind of quick and dirty rundown of your accomplishments in tennis and what you're doing now. Okay, yes. Um, well, I started playing tennis, uh, running around the court when I was two years old after my parents at the country club picking up tennis balls. And then I started taking lessons at five, but I really started playing at seven when uh, I 
played my first novice tournament and I lost to the coach's daughter and I was very upset and I did not want to lose her again. So I started practicing all the time. And from that point, tennis really took off for me. I became number one in Southern California in the 10 and unders. And then I was number one in the nation in the 12 and unders. When I was 14 years old, I won the junior orange bowl. And then shortly after that, I turned professional and played on the professional tour until I was about 18 and then I had an injury and now I'm in medical school. And that's incredible. And so as a young pro, um, what are some of the challenges that you faced out there being, you know, just a 14-year-old girl uh, on the road with grown women? Well, I started traveling sometimes by myself since the age of 12. So that was an experience. Um, It really makes you grow up quickly (laughs) to learn how to navigate uh, the airports and get to the tournaments and all the countries. And and not even that, but you're not completely developed as a 14-year-old. So to compete against girls who are 18 in their 20s and just the mental toughness aspect of it can be very difficult and challenging. So, Gail, let me ask you, what made you expose your daughters to tennis to begin with? What got you all started in this sport? Well, I played recreation. I was a national uh, swimmer, and and I played, you know, run track. And then I started playing tennis at 16 and fell in love with it and played with Hank Fister's father at Bakersfield Junior College in California. And he wanted me to play on the team, and I said, oh, no, no, no. And I just fell in love with it. So I became a country club wife that played tennis all the time. And uh, Nicole's dad was a very good player. He wanted They wanted him to play pro and play for USC, which is University of Southern California. And he said, oh, no, that's a sissy sport for girls. You know, back then it was 65 years ago. So we just played all the time, and she ran around picking up balls, and she just fell in love with it. So we just started her out, and she was a dancer full time and did beauty pageants. And between dancing and beauty pageants and tennis, she just, you know, started playing and did unbelievable. And I think she was five years old when she went to Bakersfield Racquet Club, and all the kids would play tennis, and then they'd go all in the swimming pool and take a break in the afternoon, and she wouldn't go in the swimming pool. And the coaches called me and said, we can't get her to come and join the kids in the swimming pool. Well, she always went on the backboard because she wanted to beat everybody. (laughs) So she had that that drive from a very early age. Yes, she had drive all along from her dance competition and her beauty pageant. She just was self-driven from a very, very, I'd say two years old, she was self-driven and always wanted to be the best at everything she did. And, you know, I have to say parents can feed that into a child also, you know, and teach them to, you know, always be ahead of the class, be first in line, be the best, get the best grade. And she was just raised that way and she just loved it. So when did you realize that all three of your daughters, because you now have Tyra and Alicia, too, who are making big waves uh, in junior tennis as well as on the Pro Tour, when did you realize that they had the talent and the desire and the drive to make it on the professional tennis tour? I think all of them, we knew when they were very, very young, they all had so much talent at a very young age. They all, you know, played since they were two, one and two years old, picking up balls, running around the court. We all, um, I worked at a tennis academy for many a years, and they just ran around and had a great time, and that was their life. And when Nicole was eight, she said, I want to play full time. I want to move to Florida and play with everyone else and all the good kids. And we moved her back here at nine years old to Florida. And then the other two just grew up on the tennis court. And they had, you know, really no life when they were under five years old. And then they started school after that. So they were constantly doing fitness, picking up tennis balls, playing tennis, learning to volley at a young age when they couldn't hit a backhand over the net yet. And they just fell in love with the game, and they just went from there, and they were very athletic, and they all just, we kept pushing and pushing and pushing, and now they're all top in the world for their ages. That's fantastic. Once you realized, Gail, that these girls had something special, how did that change or did it change your approach to training and competition? Yes, well, when Nicole was nine years old, eight years old, we kept in California trying to find where to go train. I was driving her down to the Brian's dad, Wayne Bryan, Bob and Mike's dad, 
And that was a two and a half hour drive every day. And I was driving her down there to Rio Racquet Club. I was taking her down to Rance Brown every other day. And it's now assistant coach at UCLA. And those two coaches were doing a lot with her. But, it, you know, it was driving every single day. And so we finally, I kept looking up Macy Tennis Academy, and I was looking up M-A-C-Y, like the department store. And, of course, Rick Macy is M-A-C-C-I, and we didn't have academy, we didn't have computers to Google back then. So I kept calling information, and they told me I was crazy. There's no such M-A-C-Y. And so I met Orisine Williams, Venus and Serena's mother, at the Acura Classic in Manhattan Beach years ago when Nicole was nine and she told me how to get back to Florida and I should come back to Florida and I should take them to Rick Macy's, how great it was. And I came out and tried it when she was nine and a week, two weeks later, we were living in Florida. (laughs) We never went back. (laughs) Wow. And, you know, when you and I spoke, uh, I guess it was last week or two weeks ago, one of the things that you kept saying over and over again that really hit a nerve for me um, was that this has to be a family commitment and the the family has to be willing to put the work in to help the player reach these high levels of the game. Can you kind of go into detail about what that meant for you and your family? What kind of work we're talking about here? Because when you started telling me what you did, I it's like, oh my gosh, I, none of that ever occurred to me as a parent. Well, first I thought Nicole was a great, great player in California because she was number one in tens at nine years old and number five in twelves, and I thought she was the greatest thing. And we came back to Rick Macy Tennis Academy, and they had all the top 12-year-olds all over the world, and she couldn't beat anybody. I mean, I was totally embarrassed. I, she was nothing. I was deflated that my child wasn't what I thought she was because I came to where all the competition was, and that's what brought us back. I said, I've got to be near the competition, but it took something full time. So I gave up my business in California. I gave up my beautiful, beautiful home on an acre of land, a swimming pool. Uh, I was driving a Porsche and I sold everything and came out here to Florida and lived in a little apartment and worked for Rick and managed the academy and housed 11 girls and fed them all and hired the coaches. I just, I mean, I did everything and gave up my whole life for my daughter's tennis and I just continued to do that. And if you look at all the top parents or players in the world, most of them have a pair and even Belinda Benchik that just won this last tournament. Cincinnati, I mean, her father gave up everything and all he does full time is take care of her tennis and travel with her. And that's really what it takes if you really want a child to make it from a young age all the way up. Nicole, hearing your mom tell these stories, what, I mean, how does that make you feel? Are you, are you proud of what you've accomplished and proud of what she's accomplished? Um, I just wonder what kind of pressure, if any, you felt realizing that your mom was making these huge sacrifices for you to be successful in the sport. Well, I do think that um, obviously what my mom has done has been, you know, great for us and, and given us the opportunity. Um, there's no doubt there is a significant amount of pressure uh, when you're doing that and growing up and competing on that kind of level. But that's not just with tennis. That's really with any sport. Um, so there's definitely the pressure there. But I think that a lot of people ask me, you know, looking back, do you, you know, I didn't go to school in a typical classroom in in high school, and I I didn't go to prom, and there's a lot of things I didn't do, and people say, do you feel like you missed out on your childhood? Well, now looking back, it's created so many opportunities for me, and I've traveled to over 40 countries, and I've met people from so many cultures, and I've become very open-minded, and it really has instilled this hard work and discipline that's carrying over into everything I do. So I think the fact that I was able to do that um, was great. I think that maybe to instill that message for players coming up that, you know, having the pressure situations, not just saying that, 
you know, if if you don't do tennis, then you're not going to be able to do anything else. But knowing that anything in life, any job you have that you want to do great in and accomplish, or if you go in a different sport, anything, you're always going to be encountered in, you know, in this pressure situation. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, one of the things we talk about with any sport is that an athlete is always one injury away from being finished with their sport, right? And that, you know, that's was your reality. You you ended up uh getting injured and and had to had to leave the tour. What was that decision like? And and you know, how did you feel because even players that aren't striving to play at the professional level deal with that risk of injury on a daily basis and ending dreams of even playing high-level college tennis or any college tennis for that matter. Um, it's a scary thing to ponder. And as a parent, you know, I, I find that one of my biggest dilemmas is making sure that my son is well-rounded so, God forbid, he does get injured and, and can't continue playing tennis, that he's got other things to pursue. Obviously, your mom and I, I, I'm assuming your dad to some extent as well, um, were very successful in helping you become a well-balanced person. Yes. Um, I was always, you know, had education um, in the background uh, as well. My father um, was a, a school teacher and he was very big into education and he wanted to make sure that, um, you know, both my parents, that I, you know, pursue that if something happens. I had a an interview on television when I was nine years old. I had just won a tennis tournament, and they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I said, well, if there are only 48 hours in a day, I would, I would love to be a doctor and a professional tennis player. And fortunately, now I'll be able to do both. But um, that was always in the back of my mind, and um, so the plan was to to hopefully pursue medical school at some point, but I didn't think it would be at at 18. I thought it would go back later after my career. So I think it is so important to um, maintain an education, um, you know, while pursuing a Sports because even after, even if you have a full career and you make it to number one in the world, it's still important to know how to manage your money and um, maybe you'll want to run businesses one day or, you know, anything else you might be involved in that you just never know. It's There's so many other factors than just getting on the tennis court and getting balls, even sure. when you're number one in the world. So it's so important uh, learning how to to speak you're going to be in interviews you know there's so many opportunities from that that can present itself so that's why it's so important to have the education as well when you did get injured and and came to the realization that you were done playing tennis for a living how did you manage your emotions during that period because I have to think that was pretty devastating right yes it was I I did not know um, when I initially hurt my back if I was going to be able to come back to the tour or not. And I was out for about a year. And at that point, I started taking college classes at Florida Atlantic University. And I started doing pre-med courses. And I was um, doing general chemistry. And um, having been out of a formal classroom setting in so long, it was really difficult to get back into that. And I started pursuing those classes, and it was it was very difficult at first because in the t- tennis community, I knew a lot of people. That's the main people that I hung around, and um, and so everywhere I went I, in the tennis courts, and I knew a lot of people. And then going into this huge public university, I didn't know anyone, and that was very overwhelming. And it really, I felt like I lost a sense of identity, and and what was I, and who was I, and what was the purpose for me? I didn't, (laughs) I felt like I lost my purpose in life because it was so dedicated to tennis. And so that was a very difficult um, point in my life. And it it took a long time to (laughs) overcome that. What helped you get past that? Because that's a big concern. And, you know, we see it even in the juniors, you know, at, at the level that most kids are playing tennis 
they they are wrapped up in in their tennis identity and so you know whether it's in their local community or at their school or wherever it is and and when they're out with an injury and maybe you know faced with the possibility of not being able to play um that's a huge dilemma to deal with and at, at 18 i mean goodness <laughs> yes it, it was difficult um, it did not happen overnight that I got over it. It it took a while, even through most of college. But I think once I, you know, ended up getting in, into medical school, then I really felt like, okay, this is this is for me, and now, um, you know, this is my purpose. And and you know, I had so many opportunities these with tennis and traveling and doing all that but now I get to pursue another dream of mine and I think once I finally was able to do that um now I know that this is a different path for me and but so many things still carry over from tennis that sometimes I feel like I'm still playing (laughs) that's awesome Gail can you chime in here and kind of take us back to that time when the realization was starting to set in that Nicole was going to have to choose a different path, yet you're still, you've got these two younger daughters that are on this tennis pathway. How do you balance all that as a parent? Well, it worked out good. Nicole had wanted to be a doctor since she was three years old when her tennis career was over. And uh, so when she got injured, she decided just to go back to FAU originally and do a couple years of college while her wrist healed and she would go back on the tour. And she did so good and got such great grades in college the first two years. She says, oh, I think I'm just going to go ahead and go ahead and become a doctor now. And so that's the route she went, and then she went ahead and gave up her tennis instead of going back, starting over from the very beginning. So that was totally her choice, and I think she did the right thing. You never know if you would have blown out the wrist again the next year or if it would have stayed healthy for five or ten years. You don't know. But she loved school. She loved working in the medical field, and it just all worked out great, and she's totally happy now. (laughs) That's fantastic. So... Gail, I'm going to jump back to you a little bit and talk about that decision for your kids to turn pro at a young age and, you know, balancing the decision with, is this the right choice for these children, our family, versus going the college tennis route? What what factors came into play during that decision, or was college even a consideration for your kids? Well, college we always talked about as they got older, but going pro was always the priority, and that if they turned pro, we knew they were all good from a very, very young age. So it's my two uh, smallest ones were unbelievable. Their dad won three gold medals on the Pan Am Games Olympic track team for Jamaica, and he was on the Davis Cup team. And, you know, I was a national swimmer and ran track also. So they were just so athletic. And uh, we just knew from a very young age they were going to be professional players. And we always said, you know, keep up your school. You can go to college someday when you're done, and you can make enough money going pro and getting contracts from companies, you know, to help get you to your tournaments and pay for college later if you're that good. But you've got to make sure that they've got the talent and they're on the right pathway. And all three of my girls have Orange Bowl titles, and um, I'm just very proud of them. We've pushed them since they were very, very young. They've been raised on a tennis court. Uh, Alicia, Nicole started a little bit older. Alicia and Tyra have been on a tennis court since they could walk. Alicia was born at Rick, when Nicole was at Rick Macy's in the little carrier, and and we were all out on the court picking up balls, and they were sitting in the shade, and they learned that when they could crawl to go pick up balls. So it's just been a family affair the whole time since the two younger ones were born. So it's just kind of a way of life that that's the way of life they were raised. They didn't know anything different, really. Was this a decision that you came to within your own family, or were there outside factors, outside people that helped guide you through this decision? Um, Because I know, I mean, I've talked to uh, parents whose kids are turning pro now at an older age. They're, you know, at 18, deciding between college and pro and choosing pro, and, and there's such little 
guidance given by our governing body for these families, I'm wondering if it was different when when you were going through it. Were you getting guidance from USTA or any particular coaches or other parents, or how did that work for you? No, no one's going to give you guidance because you can go back supposedly and sue if somebody tells you, you know, you should go pro, give up college, and then somebody with, you know, the laws in America, you can come back and sue somebody. You told me to go to college, not to go pro, or you told me to go to pro and you gave up my college scholarship. So no one wants to get involved and tell you what to do. It has to be a decision on your own. But we had a lot of uh, help as far as from Gavin Hopper, who was Philippus's Amanda Kutzer's coach. They were one and two in the world. And he gave us a lot of help. And, you know, we worked some with Chris Everett and Nacha Talova and uh, Martina Hingis's mom and Nick Bolateri. And, of course, we were at Rick Macy's for a long time. And this girl still go to him on and off. And we just had a lot of guidance of where that they were going in the right direction. And we kept them with all the best coaches around Florida and California. And we knew they were on the right path. And so we just made the path as going pro from the very beginning. And we also knew that, you know, you can go to college, but the the statistics for a woman, the boys are different, but the girls, I think they've only had a couple girls that ever, you know, went to four years of college in the last 30 years that even made top 100, and you barely can make any money in top 100, so if you got a chance to be top 50, 40, 30, I mean, we just, we went all the way and put everything in it, and then like Nicole got injured and the other girls, my youngest one wants to be a veterinarian after tennis, so... You know, we all have backup plans, you know, if anything does happen, but we've just guided them the right way and, you know, kept them going strong at, at a young age. Great. I got an email question from one of my listeners, Gary, and he wanted to know um, from from you, Gail, having three kids that have gone and are going through USTA player development, and I'm not sure your kids really went that route, but maybe you can expand on that. Um and the competitive structure during very different periods of time, what changes do you believe have been good and which ones do you think are hindering players today? Well, I don't, I don't really want to get into that. We do use USTA as a great system. You do have to have them for help. You have to have them on your side. And if you stab them in the back, you're not going to get help. You're not going to get the wild cards that you need. And you do need the USTA. I mean, they take you to a lot of tournaments, a lot of group events. My 14-year-old just got back from Czech Republic playing the World Tennis Juniors, and they were in the finals against Russia. And so you do need USTA for many, many things, and it's great practice over at the USTA, but, you know, I think you also have to have your own uh, guidance, you do, you know, that you do your own plan, and then you US, use USTA when you need help. Always have them, you know, to help you when you need help. If you think something's right, you can use them, you know, if not, you know, that year, if things aren't the way you think, then do your own thing, and you, they've always, if you're a great player, you, they're always going to help you. Right. Okay, that's that's a very diplomatic answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you're, I mean, all three of your girls played some junior circuit in the U.S., but they also did the big international ITF tournaments, the team events. Can can both of you, Nicole and Gail, talk about what you feel like the benefits are of going outside the the USTA at home kind of structure, junior tennis structure, and expanding into the international competition structure. Go ahead, Nicole. Well, I think that... Um you just see a whole different uh, variety of tennis going out and, and playing against players all over the world and um, that you don't wouldn't necessarily see in the U.S. except for a few tournaments. Uh, so that part is great, just expanding the competition aspect of it. Um, I think one of the biggest things is, 
and it sticks with you forever is just going around being able to travel and and meeting players and um, people from different cultures and countries. And it really just teaches you so much about life in general and, and just seeing the world for yourself is such a great geography lesson. And there's so many things just in that aspect I think you learn um, aside from just the competition aspect. I encourage all my friends that if they can go the ITF route, what ITF is International Tennis Federation, and it is a stepping stone between the top national juniors when you reach the top in the United States and then you want to go to the Pro Tour, and it is the stepping stone between the junior United States circuit and the professional circuit. That's really what it's for, for the top, top players. But I also encourage my kids I work with or consult with to, if you've got the money, it's very, very expensive, to go off to the Caribbean, all the Caribbean islands in South America and Central America, and they have all the grade fives and a few grade fours. And you can go to all those and get in if you're ranked about a 1,000. And, you know, if you win six of those grade fours and you have a good doubles partner and do well, you can get up in the 150 or so in the world and you play a few more tournaments, you can get in the qualifying of the Grand Slams after a year, you know, if you really commit yourself to it and you've got the money to get to those tournaments. And what an opportunity for any boy or girl to be able to go play a qualifying Grand Slam. They know they'll never be playing a real Grand Slam, a lot of those kids, but the opportunity to say, I was on the grounds of Wimbledon or U.S. Open or French Open or Australia, and I got to play qualifying and all the pros were there, and I just think that's such an opportunity for kids that know they're not going to be top 50 in the world or 100 in the world to at least give the opportunity to try and play the Junior Grand Slams. You'll never, ever be there besides a visitor again, but it's just a great opportunity they'll have the rest of their life talk about. You mentioned the cost of playing ITFs, and, and we all know the cost of travel just keeps going up, 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 up. What are some of the things that your family did to help offset some of that? I mean, you mentioned selling your car, selling your house, and, you know, I know you made some some huge trade-offs to provide these opportunities, but what are some other, you know, very practical things you did that other families could maybe learn from? There's many things. I string rackets. I bought a stringer. I've strung rackets since Nicole was six years old. And, you know, you can get 10 whatever dollars, 10 $15 for stringing rackets. We used to have a portable stringer when Nicole traveled, and we took it around to tournaments to help pay our expenses. And you also can take another player with you. And if the girls are your level, you can play doubles together. If not, they can each get doubles partners, and the parents are going to play, you know, they need someone to travel with anyway. And what a better person to go with than kids are the top in the world. So I've also taken other kids who have paid all my expenses for my daughters to go, and I've been the chaperone, and I supervise all the – I coach also, so I've supervised all the hitting and, you know, getting the doubles partner and making sure they get their breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And uh, I'm, you know, on a very tight schedule when they go off to these tournaments that they get their sleep and not too much in the pool. And you can do it that way. I've also had parents tell me that my girls could go with their children and they would pay their expenses as if they would play doubles, which works fine if you're about the same level. But when you get to where they're not your level and they're playing a grade five and you're up to a grade two, that doesn't work. So there's so many options you can do where you can share the expenses or share the expenses by a coach and split the hotel or put three girls in a room. There's just there's so many options you can do to make it more affordable. Sure, sure. Okay, Nicole, I'm jumping back to you now. Um, you're in medical school, and yes. you, where, what point are you in your medical training? How many more years do you have? I am in my fourth year of training in medical school, and so I will be applying for residency programs to start um, next summer. And I'm looking to go into family medicine and that will be three years more of training. And then after, I'm looking into the possibility of doing a sports medicine fellowship. And then I would like to work, if I do that, in some tennis medicine as well. So talk about why you feel there's a need for 
people like you who have attained very high levels in the sport to come back in from the medical or training side of things. Um, I know just you know, in our family's personal experience, it's very difficult when my son has been injured, and we live in Atlanta, which is a tennis mecca, um, but it's very difficult to find medical professionals who know and understand how to treat a kid that's on a pathway to, you know, play college tennis or professional tennis. What do you feel like you're going to be able to bring to the medical profession? Well, I think as far as the primary care aspect, um, it, it's very important uh, because if, if a child has asthma or diabetes, uh, things like that, you you will treat them differently as, as someone who's very active. So I think having the knowledge in that, um, you know, will help um, athletes. Also, from the sports ma- medicine side, um, I think I can sit there and I know that. Uh, you know, talking to parents and and the kids that what it's like, I've been through it. And I know that if you say take two weeks off their ankle, they're going to take a week off or maybe a couple of days. (laughs) So (laughs) knowing what, you know, knowing how to alter that. And, you know, there's certain uh, types of physical therapy, you know, to get them back quicker. And and just knowing the timeline um, can be different than the general population. So I think I can bring that aspect to it. And it's just so important. And not even just with tennis athletes, but um, in general, so many people are trying to become more active with obesity becoming more prevalent in chronic medical conditions. So I think it's so important to understand the, you know, the preventative side of it, the active part of it it, with medicine. And um, just, it's so important these days as as kids are starting sports younger and younger, you're starting to see um, injuries increase at a younger age. And it's so important to um, become involved and talk about you know, preventative um, injuries and uh, proper warm-ups and, and things like that. And one of the organizations that I've been involved with is called Society for Tennis Medicine and Science. And they are the the, the leading medical authority for um, tennis. And so they're a great organization, and I've been working some with them, and I hope to become um, you know more involved with them as I further my training. Is there a website for that organization? Uh, yes. Uh, we've recently made um, Gone Live with social media. Um, there's a Facebook and there is a Twitter account as well. And there is a website. Uh, it's Society um, Tennis Medicine and Science. Okay. Awesome. I'm going to make sure I add a link to that on uh, parentingaces.com because I think that's a site that parents should at least have in their back pocket and, you know, have as a resource if they need it. Yes, are... it's great. We'll be starting a blog on there soon. And then we, on the Facebook and Twitter site, where our goal is to post uh, daily articles uh, relating to uh, tennis and players and uh, tennis medicine. So that will be great to check out. Oh, yeah, for sure. Gosh, where were you a few years ago? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is all starting now, so it's it's really starting um, to become big, and we just hope to get out there in, in the community worldwide and, and get the knowledge out there. Absolutely. So when you were going through your injury, and Gail, maybe you can speak to this as well, were you able to find medical professionals that got it, that you were a professional athlete and, you know, that your livelihood was at stake here and the psychological impact of that as well as the physical aspect of it? Or Oh, know, yes. We you... were here. We were Go here ahead. in Boca Raton and all the top doctors were here, worked on Serena and Venus and all the top players and 
uh, again, the Williams sisters uh, let us know where to go, and we went to Dr. Mark Golden here in Boca Raton that has Golden Orthopedics, and he was fabulous. And Nicole, at 10 years old, rolled her, well, fell on some pine needles on some tennis courts, and three doctors, orthopedic surgeons in Fort Lauderdale, told us we needed surgery, and we were four weeks from playing national clay courts, and then we had hard courts a few weeks later, and I was like, we're not doing surgery, so we found this Dr. Golden, and he goes, no, you do. He's a DO doctor, and he says, you do physical therapy, come in twice a day. I guarantee she'll be playing nationals in three weeks. She did. She won national singles and doubles and went on to hard courts and won singles and doubles and was the first girl to win everything since Lindsay Davenport, singles and doubles, hard courts and clay courts, wow. all from having the right doctor that did physical therapy instead of surgery. Well, and that's that's the key, right, having the right doctor Nicole, it sounds like you are on track to be that, quote, right doctor. And I, I'm just curious, do you see yourself getting involved with junior tennis, professional tennis, both? Yes. Um, well, back to what my mom said, I um, feel like I was very fortunate um, to encounter a lot of great doctors in the South Florida area. And a lot of them had a, a big effect on uh, me going to medical school, and they were very inspiring and um, just wonderful role models. And one thing I, I feel like I did have more difficulty um, encountering as an active player was from the primary care medicine aspect of it. And that's uh, one of the big reasons that I chose to go um, into the primary care family medicine aspect of it um, instead of orthopedic surgery. Um, so I think that will be a great opportunity. And what was the last part of your question? Well, just the, you know, the the way that um, the doctors approached your care, um, you know, and, and the psychological impact of injury, how... You know, was that a positive? Was it a negative? What did you learn from that? And what will you take from that as you go into your own practice? Well, um, I was very fortunate with that. And uh, one doctor, um, she had done perform my wrist surgery. She's an orthopedic surgeon down in Miami, Dr. Lett. And she was very inspiring to me. She told me when I was 15 years old, she knew about my interest in medicine. And she said, if you decide to go in medicine, um, it will be great. Um, they will love it in medical school, and they will love it, you know, being able to be on that level of an athlete <laughs> shows the hard work, dedication, and discipline that it took to get there. And she was very um, encouraging in that aspect. And when I've seen her with all of her patients, um, she's very she's very nice to them. She talks to them about life after um, their athletics no matter their age and you know what they're going to do and uh, she's very encouraging that you know they can do really anything that they they set their mind to and I think it really helps them because so many aspects it's not just a physical aspect of getting over an injury but mentally as well if you know a lot of times if you're injured and you have a bad mindset about it or you believe that you know, your career is over and there's a less chance that you will be healed from it or um, be able to go on to do other things in life. So, so many things come, you know, from the mind. And just by having the opportunity, I've encountered some great physicians and I hope to take that same mentality into my practice that um, hopefully I can, you know, get the players uh, back on the court uh, as quick as possible or to, uh, you know, whichever sport they're doing. But if not, you know, show them that it's okay. There are other things that they can accomplish. And from doing tennis, you learn so much. You learn hard work. You learn discipline. There are so many things that as you're growing up as a junior player, you don't even realize that are happening. And it just carries over into everything you will do in the, in the future. You're working long hours. You're used to doing that with training and uh, the discipline every day, day in and day out it, that it takes, it really just carries over in, into your life in the future. And you almost don't even know how to not be like that. Um, but I would like to work with from 
to young juniors all the way up to professionals, every aspect and every level. Gail, you and I, when we talked last week, you were telling me about Nicole's ability to to compete in what has been traditionally a male field with medicine and medical school. And you were talking about exactly what Nicole was just saying, the, the lessons that she gleaned through her tennis training um, that carried over. Can you all both expand on that a little more? Because one of the things I write about a lot is the life lessons that tennis teaches our kids. And regardless of what their results are on the court, they can still learn these lessons and carry them forward into whatever they do after tennis, as you said, Nicole. So can you all talk a little more specifically about maybe, Gail, you from from the parent standpoint, what you've seen in, in all three of your daughters, and Nicole, maybe from a more practical standpoint, you know, the specific things that tennis has helped you with as you've gone through your medical training? Well, I started they were so good because they started so young that they always had to play the boys. Like uh, Nicole got knocked out in the chest and knocked the wind out of her on the court at eight years old because she played with all the high school boys. And I didn't baby her. I said, just get up, shake it off, and get on the court again. You know, you want to play with the high school boys? Get up and play with the high school boys. And I've been the same thing when they have their monthly menstrual cycle. Just, you know, <laughs> honestly shut up get on the court, play tennis, forget about it, I don't want to hear about it, you know, you're in a man's world and, you know, get out and play, you want to play with the boys at practice, and be like a boy, and never let a boy beat you, I've always told them, of course, you know, when you get to the pro level, those boys, and Nicole used to always beat Andy Roddick, and by the day he was 16, she couldn't even get a serve back, so, but I taught my kids since a young age to always play with the boys, be as good as the boys, you know, you're going to have to play boys because girls your age are not at your level. When you're top in the world at your age, who else is there to play with but older boys? So, they've just always grown up, you know, I would say in a man's world where they're playing all the boys and I make sure they're not just on a court with girls and I think they've learned to live a life of, you know, a man, a woman's world, and I just teach my kids it's all hard work, and, you know, someday you might be working with a man or have a man, you know, old school. <laughs> I'm in my 60s, so, you know, back then a lot of women didn't have the jobs that they have now, and, you know, more power to them now that they've taken some of these jobs, but, you know, I always tell them, you know, you might be in a man's world and you, you can't go and call in sick once a month. My parents just raised me very tough you know you want to work with the best you better be the best and you better just be tough as nails and that's how my grandmother raised me the same way so and we have a ranch and the women got out and did everything the guys did on the ranch so um i think they've just been raised the way of you know tough as nails all through their lives since they were born and do you think that that is a prerequisite for finding success in tennis, not to mention other areas of life, but do you think that tough as nails attitude is a prerequisite for success on the tennis circuit? Oh, absolutely. You know, kids want to make their tennis players. They start them 10, 11, and 12 years old. It's okay, but reality is 99% of those kids are going to go on to college and, you know, in China, they pick all the tennis players and the gymnasts and all the athletes at two years old, and they take them away from their parents and train them and develop them. And it takes that young age, you know, up till seven years old, you can add hand-eye coordination, and you must work at a very young age to get the best hand-eye coordination you can have at seven. So if you don't start a tennis player, honestly, at a very, very young age, developing all the basics and you know, teaching them the basics, a girl 12, a boy 14, they've kind of got what they're going to get, and they start going through puberty, and it's almost impossible to teach them a lot of basic things. So, um, you know, I think you've just got to teach them tough as nails to get out there. As Rick Macy, one of his quotes I love is, if you can't run over glass and hot coals you and get to the ball, then you're not going to make it. You know, you have to be willing to cut your feet and burn your feet to get to the tennis ball to ever make it on the pro tour, and that's so true. And then another Another one of his quotes is, you know, if you go out and your kids don't want to run down a ball, they're in the wrong sport. Go take up golf. <laughs> <laughs> but he does have some wonderful quotes on his Macy website. They're called Macyisms, and he tells it like it is. You know, either do it or get out of the sport. You're in the wrong sport, and I love it. <laughs> 
And, and you, you're you the same way. I mean, that's one of the things that drew me to, to wanting to talk to you today is you tell it like it is. There's no sugarcoating. This is a tough sport. Um, most sports are to attain the highest level. And if you're not willing to make the sacrifices, you're just flat out not going to get there. All the talent in the world doesn't get you there if you don't make the sacrifices necessary. Correct? That's that's correct, but I think parents need, we could almost go into a whole show one time on how to pick a tennis coach, but too many parents are have money, and the coaches find out they have money, I'd say 98% of the coaches, and they're telling the parent what they want to hear, that how great their child is, and reality, whether their child's great or not, they need to hear the reality so their child learns what they need to learn to make it. You know, whether they're going on to college or they have a chance to go pro, the parents need to hear that they need more fitness or they need this or they need that. And so many parents are just listening to the coach who I call them used car salesmen. They tell you what you want to hear to put the money in their pocket. And, you know, that's why you have to go to somewhere like, say, Rick Macy, where he tells you like it is and you're there with all the top players and from all over the world. And and he just says, you know, this is the way it is. And he gives a lecture all summer every day for a half hour. 4 to 4.30 with all the parents and kids and he he tells you like it is and you know if you don't want to hear it then I think you're in the wrong sport or just go play play recreation tennis and have a great time you know you won't even play the college level if you don't want to put the work in and then if you start your children older you've got that much more work you've got double the work to do Mm -hmm. yeah well I'm going to take you up on that offer to do a show on how to choose a coach because it's a topic near and dear to my heart, so I would love your input I on just, that. I want to cry at some of these parents that are just being, you know, the the coaches that are taking them in and taking their money. I just I want to cry for the dear parent because they don't know any better, and the, the, the parents need to be informed with a show of exactly what's going on, what you look for, and, you know, how you – you know, find out who they work with. Don't let them just say, I hit with Venus Serena. You know, what did they develop, you know, in, a, in any player? Who did they develop from scratch? And if you're training a player from scratch, who did they go with on the pro tour? I mean, every coach has, no one's going to take you from beginner as a two or three year old all the way on the pro tour. You know, everybody has their specialization of working with top young juniors and working on the pro tour and working on the ITF tour. Everybody's got their specialty. So, you know, you've just got to find out the truth and ask questions and show up and anyway that's a whole different show <laughs> yeah very we'll, complicated, we'll do that but... show later <laughs> so we'll definitely do that show later so nicole i'm going to turn to you now because okay. i want to know specifically you know you you've alluded to things you've learned through tennis that have helped you but but Applying to medical school, getting accepted into medical school, applying for residencies, and and you know the next step of of going into practice, these are all very difficult things to accomplish in this world. So, if you could talk, you know, maybe a little more specifically about maybe a specific experience you had on the tennis court or in training that you draw on when things get challenging for you out there. Yes. Um, well, when you're, you know, growing up playing tennis and you're playing the tennis tournaments, it can be uh, very challenging. You're competing and you're trying to, you know, you're competing on a higher level. And a lot of times you lose a match and you think it's the end of the world and <laughs> maybe you want to quit or you just, you feel awful. But then, you know, if if you keep playing tennis, you've then you've been persevering through that and you get back on the court in the next tournament and you try to do your best. And so, and I think, you know, growing up um, playing and having coaches, coaches can be very critical towards you and um, you have to learn to take criticism very well. And a lot of times they're trying to look for your best interest sometimes not depends on the coach but um but it can be very uh critical and very a very high pressured um situation very competitive um going into medical school it's it's very competitive um it is hard to get into so um it's kind of the same in, in that competitive sense um it, maybe you won't do well on the test <laughs> it's like losing a tennis match and you know you just have to get back up and 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 try again and try to do better and 
and continue on. And um, it's just, it's it, the tennis world is a very competitive world. Even on the junior level, it can be very cutthroat, very competitive. The medical world um, is like that too, very competitive. Um, I will have rotations and I'll be working with doctors and, and, you know, they, they try to break you down. Uh, they try to criticize you and, and work you really hard and, and, and they want to, you know, uh, see your breaking point. But I think, uh, from tennis, I've already had that. And so it's made me so strong and tough that it's really carried over into the medicine aspect. Um, I have no problem, you know, learning more and reading more and <laughs> um, because I'm used to it. I'm used to practicing and training. And so I think that, and it's not just in medicine, but any any job that, you, you know, you want to be successful, it can be very competitive, especially now this day and age. So um, I think so many things like that carry over. Absolutely. Absolutely. Gail, looking back now, because you're, well, Nicole, you, you've done your job with. She is well on her way to being a successful, thriving, adult, contributing member of our world society. So congratulations to both of you on that. <laughs> Thank um, you. But with Tyra and Alicia, they're still young, and there's still um, development to happen, work to be done. Can you think back on kind of the journey to this point and having the benefit of hindsight, is there anything you would do differently or do you feel like each decision that you've made along the way has been the right one at the time? No, I think I've done a good job. I learned a lot with Nicole and I've been with a lot of fabulous, great top coaches in the world that I've learned from, that I've worked with and worked for. And I think that's really, really helped me learn what to do each one down the road. You know, I wish there was like one place you should could just go train everybody, like my two younger ones now. They're both at two different tennis academies. Uh, Alicia's up at Pro World with Freddie Rodriguez and the other one, Tyra's over at Fit Academy. So they're two, you know, totally different places. So all I do all day is run, you know, they're 20 miles apart and I'm running one to fitness, one to tennis, one to the other tennis after fitness, run and get them lunch. And, you know, it's just they each have an ice chest with them for the day if I can't get back and something comes up. It's you know, I think I've learned the right way, but I do, there's no set one place. I just constantly, you know, kids change, kids move, and you've got to be with the best coaches at the time for where your child's at and what level they're at. And that's a full-time job itself, just constantly keeping your child challenged. Any regrets? Either of you. Uh, uh. I, I don't I don't really have any. I'm just I, I learn something new. I love to go to USTA player meetings and you know, you think I've been doing this twenty years, you've learned enough, but I am serious. Every time I listen to a lecture by someone different, I learn something new. And I have an open mind. A lot of parents, I'm not going to that. I've heard that lecture. Well, I've heard the lectures twenty years and I'm always learning something new. And Nicole, any regrets? <laughs> You know, I would say I regret not knowing what I know now in the sense about that no matter what you do in life, if you want to be successful, it's going to be very difficult and challenging. So I think if I maybe knew what I knew now when I was 14, I would have probably pushed harder on the tennis court. I would have, you know, tried even harder than I did. I would have, um, you know, put even more effort into it. Um, I think you, uh, sometimes that's what I would say to, to tennis parents that, um, some of them may not have played at the same level that their child has played. And it's easy to, to push your kid further, but not understanding what they're going through. And a lot of times they just want the best for their child. And, you know, they're not realizing how their child is feeling or the pressure they're feeling um, under that aspect of it. But I think what's really important is to just, you know, love and support your child no matter what and teach them that, you know, it's okay if they're not doing tennis and they do something else, but if they want to be successful, it's not going to get easier. <laughs> In fact, it may get harder. I think medical school is harder, but... Um, but really instill that in, you know, in a child from a young age, um, that 
no matter what they do in life because I think sometimes um, you'll hear in academies that, oh, you know, if you don't play tennis, you'll just, you won't be doing anything or, you you know, um, but I don't think that's true. I think there are so many more opportunities out there as well, you know, once they finish tennis, but they are just as challenging and hard. Um, I think sometimes people tend to downplay life after tennis that, it, you know, it will be easier if that is somebody chooses not to play tennis that life will get easier (laughs) and I don't think that's necessarily true so I think it's so important to you know instill that that in your child and also to know that you know for different families um, maybe going professional is not a feasible option and that's okay there's still so many options even if they they go um play college tennis and and they get a scholarship and they're getting a great education or even just playing high school there's there's so many things tennis is a lifelong sport and just knowing how to play you can network and make connections for the rest of your life no matter what career you're going to and I think looking at at it that way um, and teaching their kids that that their children are going to come out successful no matter what they do in life and I think that's that's the big thing um, to teach them that and really just get out and enjoy it because it, it will pass you by before you know it. <laughs> and real quick, Lisa, my kids yeah. have been taught to deal with all the problems from a young age, from, you know, the cheating, the bullying, everything, and I've taught them to be tough and get out there and deal with it and I don't make excuses, you know, bring your lines in closer. That's a whole different uh, talk show, but, you know, bring your lines in closer. Don't let the child cheat you, but my children have been taught, all of them, since they first played tournaments five years old, six years old, deal deal with it. Deal, be tough on the court. Deal with a bully or deal with a cheater. Deal with everything and you're going to toughen up and be tough and every everything in life, you're going to have bullying and cheating and everything. So you're teaching them at a young age how to make their own calls, how to deal with bad calls, how to deal with umpires, how to shake their hands, how to say thank you. No matter how the match goes, you still shake the hand at the net to say the match is done. Thank you. I mean, there's just so many life skills that you're learning to teach these young children in 10 and 12s how to handle all the pressure and how to deal with it on the court and off the court. Absolutely. Well, ladies, thank you so, so much for taking the time to be with us today. You all have shed some very valuable light on this whole journey and, and why we're all in it. So <laughs> thank you, Nicole. I I hope you will stay in touch with me because I would love to use you as a medical resource as, as you continue through your education and, and get out into practice. I, I'm just so excited for what lies ahead head for you. And Gail, I mean, holy cow, thank you so much for being so honest with all of us and and sharing your journey with us. And uh, I know my listeners have learned as much as I have today. Have a great week and we'll see you next week on Parenting Aces. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much.